Hey fellow photographers, what did you photograph today? So today I'm going to go over to my results from testing Kodak's new P3200 film push process to ISO 25000. I'm going to be going over my developing techniques as well as showing scans from the negatives. But stick around to the end of the video for some important insight on the film versus digital debate. So some quick background. So if you haven't heard, Kodak has brought back P3200, their T-Max film. It's actually natively an ISO 800 or ISO 1000 film, but the P stands for push processing. So this film is specifically designed to be push processed. Now you can push process any film, and when you push process, you're gonna introduce more grain and more contrast into your negatives. But they claim, Kodak claims, that this has the ability to be push processed pretty far with usable results while maintaining image quality. So who would use a film like this? Well, this is definitely good for low light situations. So think about street photography at nighttime or in dimly lit places, or you wanna take pictures at the coffee shop late at night. Anything that's a low light situation is great for pushing film. Another popular place to use this film would be for concerts where the lighting is dim, you're not allowed to use flash. The only way is to use a higher ISO. Now, a lot of films don't handle push processing very well. There's too much grain, too much contrast. It ruins the image quality. So let's see how far we can push this today and see what the results look like. Let's take a first look at the gear I use. Now, gear isn't the most important thing when it comes to film, and because this is 35 millimeter, almost any camera will do. Remember, a camera is just a light-proof box. But I specifically chose to use this. This is the Voigtlander Bessa. This is the R3M version. And the reason I chose to use this is because I know its shutter speeds to be extremely accurate. And I know, you know, having used this camera, having tested this camera, having shot a lot of rolls of film with this camera, I'm confident in the results that it can produce. So I wanted something that was reliable and that was gonna give me results that I knew I could trust. Now the lens I have on this camera is a 40 millimeter f1.4 lens. It's the single coated version from Voigtlander. Now the reason I'm using this lens is because you know, I like the way it looks and the single coated version actually does well with black and white film. It gives a little bit more contrast and contrast is essentially the name of the game when it comes to pushing film to high ISO values. Now there's actually another reason that I chose to use this lens and that's because I have a similar lens in the Canon EF mount. So Canon makes a 40 millimeter lens. This happens to be an F 2.8 lens, but it's not really going to matter because I'm not going to be shooting at those wide open apertures anyway. And that's one of the advantages of, of pushing film or using high ISO values is that you don't have to, if you don't want to, you know, you're not limited by the sort of maximum aperture of the lens. So now why did I choose this digital camera? Well, it's going to give the same or similar field of view because, you know, this is by definition a full frame film camera and this is also a full frame digital camera. With a 40 millimeter lens on each, we're going to get about the same point of view. So my plan was to sort of take a picture here with this camera and then take a similar picture almost in the exact same spot on the film. The added advantage is that I can use this camera to meter because most cameras that you find are not going to have meter capabilities to meter as high as ISO 25000, which is what we're going to be photographing at. Most meters maybe go up to 3200 or 6400 if you're lucky. So when you're using the meter inside a film camera, you're going to have to probably set it to the highest setting and then add an additional number of stops and compensate beyond what the meter is telling you. Here, the Canon 5D Mark II, although it's not a good low light performer, it does give us the option of expanded ISO ranges. The highest default ISO value on this camera is 6400, but it also has H1 and H2, high one, high two. High one is expanded to 12,800 and high two is expanded to 25,600. So we're gonna be using the high two ISO setting on this camera, using the meter on this camera, kind of comparing the results, and we're gonna be setting the meter to this at the maximum, 3200, and then exposing, compensating three stops. So from 3200 to 6400 is one stop, double that again, double that again, that gets us to that 25,000 mark. So we're gonna be compensating three stops from the maximum metering capabilities of this camera. Next up, let's talk development. Now, if you've been, you know, photographing with film for a long time, you might have your own sort of methodologies and sort of routines that you stick to, or you know where you can be a little bit more lenient in one thing or the other when it comes to temperature or, or, or development time, etc. But to give this film the best chance that it has, I'm following very strict guidelines set forth by Kodak in their data sheet for this film. In order to do that, I'm going to take the film, I'm going to take the film that I have exposed and I'm going to actually load it inside a developing tank on the reel 
and this is a Jobo tank. So this Jobo tank has a cog lid and we're gonna actually put this into a Jobo apparatus, which actually is going to sort of be a rotational drum. And the advantage of this is that there's a pump and a water heater on the Jobo device to develop the film so that we can keep the drum at a constant temperature. So Kodak has published development times and temperature chimes for different combinations of developers. And we're going to be following that as strictly as possible, as well as trying to control that temperature as closely as possible. So Kodak also recommends for when you're pushing the film to ISO, you know, above 6400, you need special developers. So you need to go with their recommended developers. So I chose, because I had it handy, and I do this a lot with my sheet film, is Kodak T-Max RS developer. So using this developer, now they also, of course, recommend that you buy Kodak branded uh, stop bath and Kodak fixer, but really when it comes to the, the development process, really the branded developer is the one that you really have to worry about. Stop bath is just stop bath and fixer is fixer. So because I use Ilford products most of the time, I am going to be using just regular Ilfo stop, stop bath, as well as Ilford's rapid fixer. So this should have no bearing on the results whatsoever. It's the developer that matters. Um, Kodak just wants you to buy their stuff so they sell more of their products. Now, as you saw at the beginning of the video, there was kind of like the moment of truth. You know, when you are testing a new film, it's kind of your heart races a little bit because no matter how many rolls of film you develop, there's always that exhilaration of trying a new film or trying a new development process that you never tried before. And you're, you know, you're sitting there and you're worried. You're like, am I going to get anything? And the results are in. Um, uh, you know, probably a little disappointed, but there is information on these negatives. They are very, very thin, extremely thin. So my first blush, just by looking at the sort of negatives here in, in the sleeves or, you know, sort of doing it my mental contact sheet, my first inclination is even at pushing at that high ISO value at night, because there's so little available light, and, and film is a chemical reaction. It's not sort of a, a digital, you know, let's just pump uh, more voltage into our sensor. It's really, you know, there's a threshold. There must be a threshold for the amount of light uh, in low light situations. So at really, really low light situations, I would add one to two stops, um, you know, even overcompensating exposure when it comes to that. So, you know, two stops brighter in, in low light conditions. Now I'm curious to see in daylight conditions or in normal light conditions, if we were to push the film to ISO 25,000 because there's more available light, uh, I would be curious to see, I think we'd get better results. But for nighttime photography, which I think is sort of the target audience for people using this film or films like it, such as Ilford, Ilford's uh, Delta 3200, I really think, you know, error on the side of overexposure is, is my first guess. Now's the moment you've all been waiting for, the side-by-side -side comparison between the digital files and the film scans. So without further ado, here they are.
So like I said, it's sort of lackluster results, lots of grain, everything looks a little bit underexposed. And like I kind of said at, at first glance, about one to two stops over correction, when it, especially when it comes to super low light shooting environments. Now I'm not claiming these pictures to be any sort of fine art masterpieces. It was just a sort of test of this new film. And that's part of the learning process. And you have to sort of get to know a film and by using it over and over again. And then you find out what it's good for, what, what situations it works, what situations it's not gonna work. And then you can start to get more and more consistent results. So for a first test, I'm happy that I got something. I'm a little disappointed with the results, but I have some future ideas for directions I wanna take this film in future projects. Speaking of future projects, I actually want to sort of try and print one of these images in the dark room from the negative. Now the negatives are very thin, so it's, it's gonna be a challenge, but I'd like to see what can I, what's going to happen. I especially wanna see what this grain structure looks in large on let's say like an eight by 10 print. And it's that grain structure that brings me to my last point in sort of the film versus digital debate. Now, what people oftentimes fail to realize is that in the digital world, the noise that you see is not equivalent to the grain that you see in film. Noise is random, it's a digital noise. It's simply amplified voltages of electrons on a silicone sensor. It is completely random and it's not reproducible. Whereas the grain structure of the film, and a lot of these pictures are extremely underexposed, but you will see a uniform grain structure in those shadows. You're going to see that same grain across the entire film. So that grain is reproducible. If you like the aesthetic of that grain structure, that is one reason to shoot film. Now, when it comes to digital, you should be striving to take the cleanest images you can at the lowest noise floor. This usually means shooting at your base ISO value. In the case of my digital camera, it's 100. Some other cameras have lower, some other cameras have higher. But you wanna get as little noise as possible and maybe in post-processing, introduce noise reduction software in order to get that noise floor as low as possible so you get the cleanest image. Then, if you like the aesthetic, there are applications where you can actually add simulated grain, which is a sort of pattern, not a random noise generated by the actual camera, but a sort of software statistical pattern that applies grain over the image. So if you like the aesthetic digitally, do not shoot at high ISO values in order to introduce grain because you're not doing that. You're actually introducing noise and that's actually degrading image quality. Always try in the digital realm to take the best, cleanest, sharpest photograph you can. And then on top of that, whenever you feel like it, you can layer things on that make it look more like film. Just to wrap things up, don't make a decision on whether or not to use this film, especially at the push process high ISO values that I have, simply based off of this sort of first blush impressions of the film. This is one person doing one test using one development method. Now hopefully this gives you some insight as to where you want to take your testing. It might save you some time. Uh, you might want to try, like I said, adding one or two stops in low light situations or try your own test. And if you do, please share your results so that we can grow together as a photographic community. Now, Again, don't let this be a deciding factor of whether or not you try this film. And if you're an avid film shooter, I think you should you know, try it and you should encourage the you know, sort of production of new emulsions. Now, at first glance, I do think that the grain structure here in this film, even when push processed, is actually finer than that of Ilford Delta 3200. That's gonna be a future video that I'm going to make. I'll have to do a side-by-side -side test. So using the same or similar cameras, same or similar lighting situations, same subjects, I'm gonna be you know, exposing each film and then developing them in their own respective ways and then finding out whether or not the grain structure is actually finer on Kodak P3200. But I'd like to hear from you guys as well. Are you excited to try this film? Has this video changed your mind about certain things? Or would you like me to do more tests? I've got a couple more roles that I can go through. So if you have ideas for tests, please let me know and I can contribute something back for you guys. And as always, if any of this information was helpful, please support this channel by subscribing. And if you like this content, give it a like. If you don't like it, give it a dislike and tell me why in the comments. Don't forget to suggest future directions for testing of this film. And if you wanna stay up to date, make sure to hit the bell notification on your way out. This is Cyrus here with the Science of Photography telling you to go out, photograph things, and make actual prints of your pictures. And until next time, as always, happy photographing.